Howdy folks, we have a special video for you today because we have the 2022 Land Rover Defender here. Many of you say that underneath it is essentially this, a Land Rover Discovery. And in this video, I'm going to prove you wrong because they are very different, but we're also going to talk about the fact that some of the components are the same. Now, let's discuss the 2022 Land Rover Defender 110 SE. That's what we have here. This one prices in just over $62,000. It doesn't have everything in it, so it's not the completely loaded version. In fact, it doesn't even have the third row seating, which of course is an option, nor does it have the off-road package. However, it still can do off-roading and it still does have the adjustable suspension. And now I shall present the 2021 Land Rover Discovery. Now I'm going to try to say this right. R Dynamic S. Okay, well, it's the top of the line version of this vehicle. And as such, MSRP and then after that total with destination and other options, this one comes out to $73,225. Now bear in mind that the Defender can come in at that price or even higher. It really depends on how you have these equipped. And this one is the top of the line, so you can get the smaller engine and less packaging, hence a lower price. Follow the hand, because the hand will show you what's most important about this vehicle, and that is 38 degrees approach, 29 degrees breakover, and 40 degrees departure. Those are the angles, and they're some of the best in the business. They're right up there, very close to what a Wrangler can do. As a matter of fact, we took a very similar vehicle off-road in Moab, Utah, and proved that its off-road prowess with that lift was extraordinary. A little bit left, a little bit driver. Okay, here it comes. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, say most people don't do this. Most people don't do this to the brand new Defender until they've owned it for like seven years. All right, watch the back. This is what I'm. This is the one that worries me. Yep, nice and slow. You're about to drop down. All right, here we go. Slow, Not... slow as you can. Nice and slow. Uh, independent slow. suspension. Is it good? That's it. Wow, that was incredible. 11.6 inches maximum lift. Now. Bear in mind that if you get the coil spring suspension, which is the base model option, it's much lower. However, <laughs> with that, you don't have to worry about an air suspension, which some people are concerned about in terms of longevity. There are a couple other things. Now, remember, the Discovery does also offer air suspension, but it doesn't offer the tire and wheel package. Now, we're not huge fans of the larger wheels, Especially if you look at some of our videos where we've gone off-road and actually sliced a tire. Alright, well now we see the, the detriment of a 20-inch wheel, and that was not even that big of a rock. Different spot, I took a different line on it, same exact thing happened. So the defender's wide, right? I couldn't go around this side. You came at it like this, yeah. hit the pinch the sidewall here. I came at it straight on, yeah. hit it right here, tire like this, and the sidewall gave out again. But compared to what the Discovery has, these are far more off-road worthy. Now, what about the rest of the vehicle? Yes, it's boxy, and yeah, they did it to make it look a little bit like the old Defender. But they did that also because when you have a boxy vehicle like this with large windows, sight lines are better. It's easier to see off the end of the hood. It's easier to judge where your front wheels are and what they're doing. And it looks really good. There are a boatload of differences between this vehicle and the Defender. Mainly what's underneath in terms of off-road ability, and that is numbers, right? So. 34 degrees approach angle, 27.5 breakover angle, and 30 degrees departure angle. That's when it's jacked up to its maximum. That also means that it's 10.6 inches off the ground. That's its maximum ground clearance. All of that is well under 
what the Land Rover Defender is. Now, with that being said, keep in mind that this does have very large and very street-oriented tires, and it actually has a different wheelbase. This is about three inches shorter than the Land Rover Defender, which means it's a little bit more maneuverable on the street. As a matter of fact, not only that, but it's actually a little bit wider than the Defender. So it sits a lot more like an actual car, or in this case, an SUV crossover. 395 horsepower, 406 pound-feet of torque. That's what you get with this twin scroll turbocharged straight six, which is also a mild hybrid. <laughs> There's a lot of tech going on here. Now, it's kind of strange for me because I thought that with the mild hybrid, it'd be a little bit more efficient than it actually is. According to the PA numbers combined, MPG is 19. This is a relatively big vehicle, so that's not horrible. I just thought it would be a little bit better with all this tech. With that being said, eight-speed automatic transmission is hooked up to this, and one of the most advanced four-wheel drive systems out there. Nice and slow. Almost there. Fortunately, not too much protection in the front, but I think you're gonna clear it. Yep, looking good. Yeah, you're good. Oh, yeah. Air suspension, baby. Terrain management, working hard. Whew. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This is essentially a detuned version of what you get inside the Land Rover Defender. And I think part of the reason why is this is a smaller, lighter vehicle. In some respects, it's a little bit more road worthy. As such, this puts out 355 horsepower and 369 pound-feet of torque. Straight six, it is turbocharged. It's once again very similar to the one that's inside the Land Rover Defender. It's also more efficient. It gets you 21 miles per gallon combined. That's not too bad. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can get the turbocharged four-cylinder as well, similar to the Land Rover Defender once again, which is awesome, but for a vehicle like this, I think you want the bigger engine. Oh, and we're stuck, dude. Look at that. Oh my, my, my. And the center diff is locked. So, so is, isn't there a little bit of traction where you can where you can get out of sticky situations? Yeah, so you can see we're pretty stuck here. Yeah. Wheels are spinning. Maybe you need to put it in a different mode. We're gonna go to mud and ruts. It's okay. gonna give us the wheel spin we need to get unstuck. And then I think we're just gonna give it some beans. All right, well, give it a shot. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, almost there, almost there. Oh, look at that. There you go, nice work, dude. Back here is where everything changes because it's a completely different configuration between the two vehicles. Part of that has to do with, well, a logically placed rear tire. That's right, got a spare that's hanging off the back, like the good old days. In order to do that, they really had to put it on a swing gate like this which opens fairly easily and it reveals 34 cubic feet of cargo space behind the second row seat. If you fold these seats down, you get 78.8 cubic feet of cargo space, which is really good. It's a big vehicle. However, the overall utility of this area here isn't as good as the Discovery, and one of the reasons why is because you have this area here which sort of intrudes on your cargo, this area, of course, as well. So, if you really value being able to lift things up and easily put them into a vehicle, I would say that the Discovery is an easier, more logical way to go. Now, by the way, this one does not have the third row seat, which would be here, but what it does have underneath this little mat that is a kit for changing your tire. I am a bit of an Anglophile. I like a lot of British things, a lot of British cars, including this and including its brother. But there are a lot of things that are very British that don't make any sense to me. And that includes getting into this trunk. Aside from using your remote, you have to go between the S and the C to find the little flap and hit that to open it. Kind of unnecessary in my mind. You know what else is unnecessary? how difficult it is to remove this. If you want the third row to go up, this has to come out. And in order to do that, you have to have this little switch up here, little switch. 
Without that, you're going to be struggling for a long time. Behind the second row, you have 45 cubic feet of cargo space. Fold the second row down and you have 74.3 cubic feet of cargo space. That's pretty good. Now, both vehicles have a cool little party trick because they do have air suspension. And if you look over here, you can lower this and it's going down right now for easier loading and unloading. Now, the reason why this is a big deal is because both these vehicles can really be jacked up. Even at their medium setting, it's pretty high to lift things up and over. However, this is a much more user-friendly cargo area than the Defender. And that has to do with the fact that there's a hatch. So the hatch goes up, meaning that there's nothing blocking you on the sides or the door blocking your access to well, <laughs> a sidewalk, among other things, or swinging out and hitting things too. That's one of the issues with those gates. However, this setup here is really good for day-to-day -day use. Not only that, but this one does have the third row seat option. And as such, A, you can fold these down automatically. That's a nice little piece of luxury. And I believe you can pull these up. There we go. Okay, granted, it's um, not that fast, but it works. Now, I have sat in the third row of these things before. Yes, it's a little compromised for someone my size. I don't know why I just did that, by the way. It's British. <laughs> it's haunted. One final thing. You have nothing. There's almost no real storage. A little tiny bit. I guess you could put a little medical kit in here or something like that, or you know, British little tea set, I suppose, something along those lines. But it's not quite as utilitarian as the cargo area inside the Defender. And I will say this, the overall plushness might make up for that because, hell, even this, I'd love this type of carpet in my house. The interiors are very different with these two vehicles, but they do share a lot. You'll be able to figure out, oh, the switch gear, it looks really similar, or the location of the switch gear is very similar. One thing that both vehicles excel at is passenger comfort. And another thing that this one does, it actually has Safari windows that you can really use. These are cool. I mean, you really have to kind of narrow your eyes in order to see through the little ports. But you see, back in the day, I had a Land Rover Discovery. It was a 96 and it had real safari windows in it and my kid loved it. <laughs> it was cool. In we go! Now, even though they do have some similar components in terms of platform and whatnot, they are very different even with the feel of the center row. This feels even more comfortable and probably because it is. Look, these seats are super plush. They have really good give. I like that quite a bit. Back is actually quite nice. These are almost as good as the front seats in terms of back support. And you have a little bit more going on in terms of components that you can play with and everything else. But I wanted to point something out that both vehicles have, and that's this right here. And Tommy told me that this is where you plug in your screen so people in the back can have a screen because their phones are obviously not enough. All right. Another thing you get, dual sunroofs, which is nice overall. And I am sitting behind myself right now and I'm around 6'1". I have tons of leg room. I have pretty good room under the seat for my feet and headroom isn't too bad. So all in all, it's very comfortable. And as I said, I think the seats in this one are a lot more comfortable actually than the ones that are in the Defender, which is already pretty comfortable. There's no question that the Discovery really does feel a little bit more premium than this vehicle, and there's a reason for that. And I actually talked to an engineer who said that they wanted a functional utilitarian interior that had some luxury in it, and they managed to do that. Technically speaking, these are screens, and they work quite good. It just takes a while to figure out what everything does. And there's something that I really do like about this vehicle and that is this gear lever because it actually is notched. You can actually feel it going in and out of gear and I really do like that. The screen is a little small. 
and making it bigger probably would make it more competitive but I don't have a problem with it I don't really like the function of it it's kind of wonky uh, it could be easier more intuitive to use typical for JLR but the one thing that you guys may notice is that this is it for the buttons that's it screen that's it I mean there's a lot of stuff that it can do um, I'm sure I can find there you go you can know different places and fuel and blah 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 it works okay um, Steering wheel, not too complicated in terms of buttons. There's just a few. Haptic feedback on some of this. Well, it's not really haptic. It's just kind of plastically clicky, but kind of makes a noise. And by the way, the steering wheel design, this is a type of plastic that does feel kind of like a kid's toy, but not like a cheap kid's toy. I, I'm not trying to put it down. Also, I really do like this setup here with the actual metal. Look at this. That is actually the metal of the vehicle as opposed to some fake thing. These screws look like they might be real as well. I do like that. So for me at least, this truck or off-roader or whatever you want to call it actually appeals quite a bit. If you look at the Discovery, it doesn't have any of that. The Discovery is really built to be much more of a luxurious vehicle. All right, inside we go. In the past, I've been a little harsh on the Discovery because I always felt that the outside looked a little too much like, say, a Ford Explorer than a dedicated Land Rover, right? Fortunately, the interior makes me feel a lot better. And that's because the attention to detail is excellent. It really does feel like a luxury vehicle. It does feel like you're kind of getting what you pay for. This screen is much larger than the screen that was on the Land Rover Defender that we were recently in. It's also closer to hand and I think that's just because of the design of the dash. Even though this dash is a lot more cluttered in terms of just, it's more like a regular vehicle, it is modern and simple and convenient. Um, I do like the fact that you have, and wait, wait for it, there it is, seat controls. That's how you turn them on. Remember I was telling you about the screens in here? Yep able to change these of course and then the gear lever even though it looks completely different it functions of course the same way eight speed automatic transmission hooked up right here unfortunately you have to hit this button for park which i hate but whatever and there's even more over here because you have the terrain select and everything so all of that is here pretty decent storage this is cool nice little button there for a very a luxurious but almost useless sized glove compartment. I think you can put gloves in there, maybe these sunglasses, maybe a cell phone, but it's so plush. I mean, if you feel it, it's very interesting. This is interesting because, wait for it. Look how far my arm goes down. Yep, it's huge. It's, it's, it's deep, I should say. It's really not that big, but I guess if you have a blunderbust and you want to put half of it in here you probably could fit it because that's what the british do when they go the countryside to hunt foxes right the blunder yeah that's what it is anyway steering wheel setup very similar to the um defender and it's interesting because there are very few components in here that do feel like the defender so this styling is similar but otherwise really they have very different personalities Follow my finger. Going to lower the suspension. Yes. It's interesting going over something as simple as ice when you are fully jacked up with the suspension, you're just really tippy. But if you drop it down to a regular ride height, it absorbs the bumps just fine. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. For most of the drivers out there, there'll be no reason to take the Discovery or the Defender off major off-road trails where you have to jack up to maximum height. It just won't happen very often, but on those few occasions that it does, if you remember to lower the ride height, you will have a much nicer ride over regular or minor terrain. Something to keep in mind. Um, I learned something. I have to play only British heavy metal when I'm driving these. Otherwise, I feel like I'm intruding. So the stereo systems are quite good. But if you manage to turn that off, it's super quiet. 
not like Cadillac quiet, but it's pretty damn quiet. Handling, now I'm in regular ride height, so I'm gonna just take this corner. It leans just a little bit, but it really doesn't seem to mind too much. Part of that has to do the leaning with the way this vehicle is designed in terms of its overall height, but on top of that, you have to consider the fact that the Discovery has a little bit more of a squat stance and it's different with its weight distribution. So the Discovery handles these types of corners with a little bit more a little bit more alacrity, a little bit more athleticism. But it's not that much of a difference. When you have a vehicle like this that's well over two tons, having more power is a good thing. <laughs> that's exactly what this vehicle has. It's actually plenty of power. I know it's not as much as the Defender, but it's more than enough to get out of its own way. Now, right now I'm in normal mode, so and we just got off an off-road surface. Really didn't notice it that much. And the isolation in here is really good. But what about acceleration? Well, here we go. Accelerate. Oh yeah. Nice surge. Very little lag, which is huge. I'm not sure if with both vehicles that hybrid, which is a kind of a mild hybrid, if that helps mitigate some of the lag that's normally associated with turbochargers. But it certainly feels like they don't have a major lag. You know what I mean? Okay. So, the rest of the vehicle. Well, handling. Yes, this is way better around the corner. Nowhere near as tippy. And one of the things I've noticed is that not only does it handle differently around the corner, so it's a lot flatter, but it also doesn't tend to nose in and nose out as you're pulling through corners either. Now I'm about to go around the corner. I'm gonna take it at a hmm, medium speed, I guess you could say. So here we go, around the corner. So there's a little bit of dip, no problem. I did that same corner just a little while ago with the Defender and it definitely had a lot more lean to it. Very different vehicles underneath, very different vehicles in terms of their personality. If you want smooth, that's really family friendly in terms of moving them in a quiet environment that has a lot more luxury, this is the direction you need to go. So what it all boils down to is the fact that the measurements are actually different. The vehicles are very different. What they do is different. Their pricing is different. Their performance is different. Their power is different. That's right. They're different vehicles. They're not the same underneath. And at the same time, they're both pretty cool. Thanks for joining me for TFL Off-Road, Fast Lane Car, Fast Lane Truck, Fast Lane Boat, Fast Lane UFO. This is Nathan. I'll see you next time.